Magnet Eye presents The Fairy Tale World of Haute Couture. For me, Haute Couture was like a virus. Once you started, there was absolutely no way you could wear anything else. Find out what handmade in Paris really means. They feel like nothing else. They're very, very light. It's like wearing a second skin. When you enter the world of Haute Couture, you find that this dress becomes a part of you, you put it on, and you don't think about it again because it has been molded on your skin, if you will. Meet the eccentric characters in a story of decadent decline. All this is a bit of Dior. And I saw his collection. <laughs> I really thought I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> That's the secret world of haute couture. I want to tell you about a club I've heard of. It's secret, highly exclusive. There are no written rules to decide who can and can't join. There's no official committee to vote you in. This club's got only about 200 members in the entire world. All women. What they have in common is the desire and the means to acquire the most expensive clothes that money can buy. So where do they congregate? Not surprisingly, it's Paris. If clothes aren't handmade in Paris, they can't be called haute couture. And twice a year, the city becomes the club's unofficial headquarters, as members fly in from all over the world to see the haute couture shows. Fashion houses are famously discreet about two things, prices and clients. I'd written to over 30 women I thought might be coming to Paris, but it was like hitting a brick wall. Almost all of them refused to meet me. I began to wonder if I'd ever get my foot in the door. Finally, I struck lucky with a newer member. She was staying where they all stay at the Ritz. Becca Casson Thrash is a philanthropist and the wife of a seriously rich Texan oil and gas tycoon. She agreed to let me in on some of the secrets of the club. Let me tell you something about what I've learned after being here for five years now. The Haute Couture is like a private club and many of the members don't want to let you in. They put you on the sixth row in the very back of the, the tent and you know you just have to you have to be patient and get to know people and let them get to know you. It all changed when Becca raised $450,000 for the American Friends of the Louvre. Discreetly, she was fast-tracked to the front row of the Paris shows. She's now a star name and a fully paid-up member of the Haute Couture Club. Becca's obsession with fashion, and Haute Couture in particular, started when she was very young. You know, I, I do not come from a family of means. I come from a loving family, uh, the working class. But when I was growing up in a little small town in South Texas, I would see the Vogues on the stands at the grocery store, but we couldn't afford to buy them back then. So while my mommy was buying the groceries, I would be flipping through. And it, w it became an obsession with me, fashion. So how much would one of those cost? Well, it's all over the place. I mean, you can find a piece for you know, for 20,000 euro, and then they can exceed six figures. It's often that I'm chairing a very important charity event. Becca stressed the importance of philanthropy in all this. Well, it's the only way I could ever even remotely justify it. I mean, I spend... I don't have children, and I spend most of my day raising money, and, and so I come over, you know, looking for one specific item for something for the Prince of Wales Foundation. You know, when I went to Balmoral last year, uh, I wore a, um, a Dior a jacket with a Ralph Rucci haute couture um, skirt. So for Becca, the vast sums she raises at her charity gigs squares the huge amount she spends on the haute couture she wears on those occasions. But what about the rest of the members of the club? I needed someone on the inside, someone who'd talk. I'd been told by a source about a Russian baroness 
now retired, who'd worked at the highest level within the business for over 30 years. She agreed to be filmed. She loves mascara and makeup, ugly clean. I asked what had driven her clients to spend such fortunes. It's a lady that if she buys uh, a car, she'll get the best car. If she goes she buy furniture, she'll buy the real thing. And if she wants a wonderful suit, she'll go to the best that can provide for it. I think it's a question, most of all, of quality. That is the, the good reason to buy couture. I think, I wouldn't call it a bad reason, but the maybe more superficial reason is wanting to be part of a certain world, world. part of glamorous people who, uh, who, who, who do that, and ladies who dress like that, being part of that group. How much does an Ecuador piece cost, and has this cost changed? You know, uh, Yves Saint Laurent closed in 2002. I think things have gone up, but a suit but in a blouse would cost anything between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. But an embroidered dress could cost a hundred thousand dollars. I'd read about a club member with homes both in New York and here in Paris, who had a massive collection. But would she even meet me? When I eventually made contact, she first asked her husband permission. He agreed. Doors were opening. Once an air hostess, Susan Goodfriend is the wife of legendary Wall Street banker John Goodfriend. Susan had built up her large wardrobe during the heady bond boom of the 80s. I was about to get my very first sighting of haute couture in the flesh. This is um, what started me on my voyage with the haute couture. And as you can see, the handwork is extraordinary with all the ribbons and the crystal aurora borealis in the center. And um, as I say, I've just never gotten over the beauty of this dress, and to this day, it enchants me. I've always been passionate about textiles for as long as I can remember. And this, for me, was the ultimate. I bought this dress. I felt like I had been transformed. It's very much the way a young girl feels about when you see your first Cinderella movie. And I, I was enchanted. I was convinced I was the prettiest girl in the street. You see? The whole thing you oh, snap I see. Yes. open. And I think that au couture does change you from the point of view that you enter into another world. And it is that a ref, very refined world and rarefied world that has become increasingly smaller. And this one I love, this is a Chanel from my vintage collection. And this I love because I think the textile is so amazing. I love the colors, I love the textile. And of course, this is one of those dresses where you can't eat because the bustier is so tight, and this is done in cashmere. And it, it, here you see all the work and the bones and the underpinnings. I learned from Susan that as a club member, it's not enough to wear the clothes. You've got to really appreciate how they've been made. It's part of the club subculture. For Susan, haute couture is a wearable art form, and she's a patron. It's worth every penny. How many pieces of haute couture would you say you, you had yourself? Oh, I have a few pieces. I don't go to bed thinking about dresses. I read books unrelated to all that. Not that I don't like that, but suddenly in the early morning, I see, especially for couture, not only I see the silhouette, the spirit, but I even see the set. I'd asked if I could follow the making of an haute couture piece. Maybe then I'd understand what all the fuss was about. Carl agreed to my request. For the coming Paris show, his magic pen is creating a dress made almost entirely of feathers. 
At this point, it's an industrial secret, a secret only me and my cameraman are being allowed to share. A few miles away, another hidden world of haute couture, an atelier with the job of incorporating some of the world's rarest and costliest feathers into Carl's design. Feathers specially farmed in South Africa. The dress is in two bits. The bottom bit is being pinned back at HQ, while the top is round the corner being embroidered. The decadence of it all. It was breathtaking. How long does it take to make an haute couture piece from start to finish? <sighs> About 150 hours. It's an average of that. Uh, the material is prepared with irons, special irons, special way of ironing it. You work the material. You don't cut in a, in a raw material. And once you've done that, the advantage is if you have a, even a silk dress done by haute couture work that way, you take it and you, uh, you pack it in your suitcase, you arrive God knows where, you take it off and it's impeccable. It was once a booming industry. Just after the war, 46,000 people were employed in it. Now it's down to some 4,500. And the reason? Mass production. Factory-made clothes, ready to wear, have become the norm both for rich and poor alike. Skilled artisans are now hanging on by a thread. There are only a handful of ateliers left. Chanel's been buying most of them up to try and ensure haute couture stays alive. And all of these things are what makes uh, an haute couture dress so special. And there are fewer and fewer of these ateliers that exist. And if they're not supported, you lose an art form. I may have been let into the secret of the feather dress, but Carl wouldn't let me into another secret, the identity of the dress's future owner. Club members can breathe a sigh of relief. They don't want to be mentioned. You know, there are many, many rich people today the public have no idea who they are, how they look, and they don't want people to know how they look and who they are and where the money comes from, you see. So don't ask me too many questions in that area because it's like a doctor. There is a medical secret. The club members who'd agreed to speak so far were all Americans with new money. But I knew there were old families involved in haute couture. I tracked down one of them, a British club member, Daphne Guinness, she was reticent at first. It took me three months to persuade her to talk. What are you wearing now? I'm wearing a combination, which is norm normal for me. I tend to throw things together. But um, this is a couture jacket, ancient. This is a sort of woolly Rick Owens thing. And then these trousers are sort of jeans from somewhere. I put some crosses on them. <laughs> um, but, but nothing really special, just normal. Daphne's descended from the Mitford sisters. Her grandmother was Diana Mosley, wife of the famous fascist. She showed me how her pieces were made. Slightly different construction of Givenchy. They all got a different way of working and different sort of people that work there. But again, you've got the shoulders. You know, if you see the difference between a shoulder that looks like this with a seam across here, and then this, this one here, the whole arm is it's of a piece. Well, my grandmother was very um, close to Mr Givenchy, Hubert, and her sisters, too, were very keen on fashion and clothes. And then when I got married, I had my, you know, wedding dress made, and that was where the bug began, you know. It's just, and I still wear that. I still wear the suit. It still fits perfectly. It still looks wonderful. And you can't really say that about... Most things that you buy, this is over 20 years ago now. Look at the sleeve That's on that. That's beautiful. beautiful. So Daphne is a living embodiment of haute couture from times past, when the key membership requirement was to have bona fide family connections. I wanted to meet a club elder. I found one living in New York. I'd located her through her charitable foundations. After discreetly checking references, she agreed to talk to me. The doors to this secret world really were opening up. 
Multimillionaires, Mrs. Carol Petrie, was a famous beauty and a model in her youth. A southerner, she was part of a landowning family, and by marrying a baron, she became the Baroness of Patago. Looks can take you anywhere, and her first trip to Paris was by ocean liner. She's been married several times, and is now heiress to the colossal Toys R Us fortune. Mrs. Petrie's Fifth Avenue apartment block is like a stately home. Upstairs, club member Susan Goodfriend also has an apartment. Round the corner, there's a whole wing of the Metropolitan Museum, named the Petrie Court. Mrs. Petrie didn't want me to film in her wardrobes. She has a maid who takes care of all her haute couture, so she wheeled in a small sample to show me at about two dozen pieces. This was a pretty impressive haul. Is that Chanel or is that... Look at the lovely buttons on it. During the war, no one made any new clothes to speak of because that would not have been patriotic. Well, when I got to Paris, immediately after the war, that was when... Dior appeared on the scene. This is a Dior. Dior, yes. This is a Dior. Yes. All this, Mrs. Pitt, is Dior. And I saw his collection. I really thought I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> what about this one here? Is this, what sort of date would that be? Which one? This one? This yes, one. the red one. You want to know the date? All right, yes, I'd be interested. I couldn't believe what he had done with fabric. It was so extraordinary. Did he make your wedding dress? Yes, yes. Yes, he did. He did. And there was somebody else there at the time who I know that you used to go to shows with, was Mrs Simpson. Can you tell me a little bit about her and her appreciation <laughs> of haute couture? <laughs> yeah, I'm smiling because you refer to her as Mrs. Simpson. When I knew her, she was the Duchess already. And because she liked haute couture, didn't she? Oh, yes, very much. Very much. She was always in the haute couture. What was her taste like? exquisite. I've never seen her in anything that overpowered her in any way. She was always in control. Over the years, Mrs. Petrie's wardrobe standards haven't slipped one iota. I'd learned another key club rule. Maintain sartorial elegance all your life. I couldn't imagine Mrs. Petrie donning a sweatshirt. She's an example of the old school, where haute couture 24 hours a day, every day. It's the mega busy week of the shows. Paris is like a big party. I got back to my hotel to find flowers. I've been making films for over 20 years and I've never received so much as a dandelion. I hope the feather dress might come in the next delivery. But could treatment like this be why the fashion press is so famously uncritical? It's showtime. First out of the gate is Christian Dior, 2.30 Monday in the Bois de Boulogne. And here come the club members. Now I've got the chance to find out what these shows really mean to them and whether they're going to buy anything. There's Becca. managed to get backstage. There's an army preparing for battle. No club members ever get in here before the show. They'll be kept waiting for over an hour while designer John Galliano prepares an outrageous spectacle for them. 
the scene is top secret. Even looking at the model's wacky hair and makeup, I had no idea what the subject is. Club members held their breath. They were treated to a sort of homage to the French Revolution. Carnage couture with fake blood embroideries. It was high melodrama. But I couldn't imagine any club members wearing this lot in a million years. So what a Dior and everybody getting out of this. I asked Becca to explain this haute couture mystery to me. Well, I thought it was a dream. Very wearable once you extract pieces and cut them down and rework them. Because what you see on the runway is never ultimately what goes on the customer's body. It's, it's, it's done for you. So once you get in the fitting room and you get in the atelier and you say maybe less sleeve and drop the hip and whatever, it really becomes a very wearable piece of art. It is a piece of art. Can I talk to you a little? Did you enjoy the show? Did oh, very you? much, very much. Yeah? I love it, as usual. With John, is always, even for me, it's a big surprise. Uh, it's like a painter, uh, and you get all these very strong images. Obviously, this is not the volume business. We talk to very specific customers. We are going to take ideas from, you know, part of it, a jacket, an embroidery. And for that, John will develop a customized uh, couture for some customers. And then we develop the business. This is my duty. So what's becoming clear is that it doesn't matter if anyone's going to buy a dress from the catwalk or not. It's just a huge marketing push for all the other products from Dior. These fashion houses are so clever. Just by opening a bottle of perfume, we can all join the club. It had taken me over six months to get access to Galliano. He rarely gives interviews. Like Chanel, Dior is very protective of its chief designer, but he agreed to tell me the secrets of his collection. And if you look closely, it's a take on a classic um, Toile de Jouet, which has been embroidered um, on what's known as crin, which is horsehair, which is normally what you use for the underskirts of the more magnificent ball dresses. Um, but it has this amazing structure, and here you can see um, a whole work that's done with darting, but on the outside, and these blown away pockets that gives this amazing structure. And it's super light. If we try and think of it almost like a pyramid, everything takes its inspiration from the haute couture, which is a showcase um, for everything that I can do, um, which eventually has a trickle-down effect on everything that we create uh, at the House of Dior today. Like Carl, when it comes to the clients, Galliano is just as tight-lipped. I have a kind of doctor-like relationship with my clients. I don't like to talk too much about them because that's part of the mystery book tune too. Club members barely have time to throw off their stilettos before it's the next show. Valentino's at L'Ecole des Musées Beaux-Arts at 8.30 Monday night. Susan's here. And there's Daphne. This show is late, so plenty of time for club members to meet each other yet again. I tried to work it out. What's the appeal of these outfits to club members? So different from the eccentric Mr Galliano's. 
I'd heard that Mr Valentino's collection is very reliable for those stocking up on evening wear for corporate functions, in the far and Middle East in particular. There are few husbands in the audience at these shows, but I could still feel their wallets opening. I thought it was sheer genius. It was just beautiful. All the dresses were so light and airy and young looking and made one want to forget dinner and lose 10 pounds. But they were just glorious. And it was such a pleasure to be here and to see all the wonderful people. How are you? Oh, hi, how are you? Lovely to see Glamorous people like this, you see. <laughs> so how does it feel to wear it? To, it's like the difference between wearing a real piece of jewellery and and uh, a, a fake, although the other is fun too, but it's, there's a different feeling to it. You know? it's... That same afternoon, I'd gone back to Carl's. His show's tomorrow. I watched the feather dress come down Chanel's famous staircase with the rest of the collection on a production line. The whole lot is photographed and videoed for hours. <laughs> These images will go into the stores, into magazines, and be sent round the world. Videos, DVDs and a website are a club bonus for members who cannot make it to Paris. Members like Betsy Bloomingdale, who lives 5,000 miles away in Los Angeles, Yes, Bloomingdale, as in the world-famous store her husband owned, along with Diners Club credit cards, which he set up. She and Mrs Petrie are in the same social circles, and that's how I got an entree to her. Back in the 50s, the fashion houses would send Betsy things called crocky in the post, hand-painted sketches of the collections with samples of material attached. When I first started, this is what they would send. They would send all the croquis, and I would spread them all out on the floor, and I would think this one and this one, and I'd hold, you could hold the colour up to see if you like this colour or this nice red colour. Do I like the colour? And later, the, you got a tape. But it wasn't as much fun as getting all these wonderful sap, fabrics pa- samples, you know, that uh, uh, it was just different. Betsy showed me her collection, carefully stored in a series of wardrobes, over 80 pieces, that must be over half a million dollars worth at today's prices. Yeah, all of this. And these, this is a wonderful dress. This is a party dress, and this is something that you would wear, a dinner dress, maybe. Every uh, single piece is labelled to show where she wore it. Yellow. New Year's Eve at the Annenbergs in Palm Springs, and he was once ambassador in London, MoMA, that Museum Metropolitan of Art, New York City in the spring, dinner for Jean-Franco Ferre, the Davis Christmas party, the Assembly Ball in Los Angeles, the Kluge party, to the Reagan inauguration. Looking at Betsy's wardrobe, it's clear the history of her haute couture is the history of her social life. Made for Earl Spencer's birthday party at All Trip. And I wore it at the Dallas Country Club, and I wore it dinner at home here. So it's been out three times. I was astonished to see how few times she'd worn some of these dresses. When I buy something really special, I hope I'll wear it a lot to justify the expense. But here, it's exactly the opposite. So I'd learned another club rule. Don't wear the clothes too often. And for certain club members, there's a bonus. If the frocks are in good nick, after a few years you can donate them to a museum and write them off as a tax loss. Betsy, tell me about your first haute couture experience. Well, my first haute couture experience was a lady called Madame Jeanette Spanier, who was with Balmain, and she met my husband at some place, and she said, oh, she said, you must send your wife here. We want to dress her at Balmain. And I thought, well, I don't really... Why would I live in Los Angeles? I'm going to, going to Paris. But I did, and uh, I found it absolutely amazing. So I had one or two things made there. Then at that time, my husband started a business called Diners Club, and no one in Paris understood credit cards, except Jack Rouet, who was the head of Christian Dior. And because he signed up with Diners Club, my husband said, Betsy, you're going to buy everything at Dior. So that's why I started at Dior. Besides, I loved Paris. 
Paris was always beautiful, and uh, it was my first really falling in love with Paris. Everything about it was beautiful, the museums, the food, the beds, the clothes, everything. So Paris was always my favorite city. It was so different than it is today. You sat on little chairs, and it was very quiet, and the ladies came through and they would announce the number or whatever it was. This was always very straight and very perfect, and uh, the clothes were beautiful. The models came out quietly. It was, it was a whole different world, really. So, I don't know how it's changed. I mean, they don't do that anymore. It's more, uh, it's a different way. I realise they've added a new membership category, famous thin people. Some of the real members are none too happy about it. To get your clothes onto a movie star is going to be advertising in, in one form or another. And if I see something in advertising, I don't want it anymore, that's for sure. If I see it on a movie star, I don't want it anymore. It's done. Still, it is the Chanel show, and attendance is compulsory, I've been told. There's Becca. Susan Goodfriend introduces me to another senior club member I'd seen at Dior yesterday, called Dida Blair. She was wearing full club uniform from top to toe, sunglasses and an immaculately tailored suit. Apparently, she used to go shopping with club member Jackie Kennedy. She even knew club saint Coco Chanel herself. We were all enjoying ourselves so much just sitting around looking at each other that I hardly noticed the show starting. Ah, the little black dress. Chanel's trademark. The club members are being treated to 62 of Carl's dreams. Chanel is the only fashion house which claims to make decent money out of its haute couture. I'm not surprised. I'd seen inside enough club members' wardrobes by now to know they're addicted to the Chanel look. Suddenly, I spotted the feather dress. It's a club rule. Concentrate on the outfits, not the celebrities sitting near you. They walk past terribly quickly. And some of these things are so sort of complicated that you have to be able to break them down very, very quickly in your head and figure out what is going to work for you. How do you know if it's going to suit you or not? Gut. I know absolutely what will work and what won't work, and I know precisely what I like and what I don't like. There's absolutely no question in my mind ever. I suppose you can't afford to go wrong at $100,000 a throw. There's Carl. I'd heard he had to shed six stone a few years back to comply with club rules on fatties. He's mobbed at the end, of course. Everything came together in such a light, young, feminine way. And I think we were all just, you know, in ecstasis over it because it, to see that kind of beauty, and we all felt the same way, it was finally, I guess in a word, it would be ethereal. Mm. Susan qualifies to kiss him because she's a club member. But I was kept outside the inner circle, even though he'd sent me flowers. I followed the club members over to École des Beaux-Arts, to the Christian Lacroix show. After the war, there were over a hundred couture shows in a season. Now it's down to barely a dozen. There's a buzz here today, even though not long ago Christian Lacroix hit a rocky patch with his haute couture. There's Daphne Guinness, taking her place in the front row with Lucy Ferry. Becca's here too with one of her very famous friends. 
any ovation you see. The club members go mad about these dresses. I could only imagine the bun fight between them to be the only woman in the world to be seen wearing one of them. Watching this lot, I wondered how many more years decadent haute couture shows like this could continue. The day after the show, it's time for club members to go shopping. It's not like any clothes shop I've been in before. You can't just walk in. You have to make an appointment. And there are no price tags. That seems to be a club rule. Daphne's going through the Chanel stuff with the Honourable Amanda Harlick. She's employed by Carl as part of his team. I mean, like, the most incredible fabric. They spend most of the time extolling the virtues of the spectacular workmanship. This, that is so beautiful, Maria Carla. That is so beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? And there's the feather dress. I wonder if she'll go for it. Feathers into feathery tulle. Beautiful. Doesn't it concern people how much something's going to cost? Oh yes, it does. They ask, but they know that it's. They know that the the form that a blouse is about. $10,000, they know it. So the minute they come to order, they have a budget, maybe some have budgets, and they know they can afford such an amount of money or they can afford to buy three or four pieces that season. Over at La Croix, Becca is getting her individual look at the collection. Right, but it has a jacket, no? I'm sure it does. Being a club member means being on a non-stop diet. Because if you're thin enough to get into the dress the model wore, you can have it at a 30% discount. If you're a normal shape, a dress has to be made for you from scratch and you have to pay the full haute couture whack. I like to accentuate my hips and my legs because that's where I'm thin. And this right here is where I'm the biggest. So I love the blouson with the, you know, the tight underneath. But this is fantastic for someone really thin. La Croix's chief saleswoman, Marie Martinez, the directrice, is helping Becca pick something for one of her philanthropic fundraising events. Oh, the, it's the yeah, gold from the probably, show. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's on the floor. That's how the scissor back. Oh, look at that. Then I was thinking to upgrade my pants that I got them uh, the, yeah. the first time you and I yes, met. I saw jacket. a little jacket that might work. In the end, she yeah. didn't buy anything. Women can never stop. It's a special club service for overseas members. The haute couture garments are flown to the clients to be actually fitted to their bodies. The clothes are accompanied by key staff, including Rosaline Delaplace, the chief seamstress, or premier as she is known. The dresses clock up quite a few air miles. This time, the Lacroix collection is heading for New York. Initially, no one would let me in on this bit of the haute couture process, but finally I found a willing club member. Judith Carenti is an art collector and the wife of a Dutch banker. Her daughter's with her. Judith has bought a dress to wear at the Oxford and Cambridge Boat Race Ball. Along with her daughter, she's bought her stylist. A lengthy discussion ensues. You want us to add some little more lace under, like... It's well, it could, but isn't this enough? I mean, no, I don't. I don't think she really needs it. You no, mean just a, just a touch here? Yeah, it's la dentelle au milieu. Just, chantilly. just, chantilly. just very, it's no, very light. It's not this lace. Huh? It's just. I know. Chantilly. I understand. Not the guipure. The. I asked Judith to explain the allure of haute couture. It's a bit of an extension of my painting collection. I view it as as that, as that way, and it's um, something that I feel very um, privileged to be able to participate in. And it just um, adds another dimension. And she likes the exclusivity. One of the reasons she does it is to be the only one. I don't like to think that I'm wearing something that, you know, half of America has too. I love the way it 
keeps its shape. It has its own shape. So. You, can, you can try it on if you like. I'd waited weeks for this, but I'm finally going to get to try on some haute couture. It just feels fabulous. It does feel quite unique. And you look quite unique. <laughs> I sounded like all the women I've met so far. I wonder if I could pass for a club member. And if I could, would I want to? Suddenly, I could understand what they'd all been going on about. You always feel comfortable in it. And once you, you put it on the first time on your back, you have the impression you've had it there all your lives. If I've discovered one thing, it's that club members are united in their belief that haute couture is a collectible form of art. From their point of view, and with their money, it's a sensible purchase, an investment. If you look at it as an investment, like you would a piece of contemporary art, something that you buy and you have forever, towards the end of your life, you give it to a museum. Very much like you would a, a Jackson Pollock or a de Kooning or a Magritte or, you know, whatever. And that's how I look at it. People don't think anything of spending masses of money on decoration or pictures or... And there's just as much work that goes into a handmade piece of clothing as the, the as the does in, into into many many works of art. I definitely think it's an art form. Absolutely, I never thought it but years ago, but I think it definitely is an art form. Absolutely. And putting the money to one side. It's as important or unimportant as drinking the best wine or driving the best car. As important or unimportant as being the most beautifully attired woman at the party. So, what of my club members? I'd read about my new friends a few weeks later in the magazines. Several had gone to the ball. I came across Daphne appearing at a National Gallery fundraising event in London. She settled for an old haute couture favourite by Chanel, but not from this latest collection. The minute she walked in, she was photographed for a society magazine. Judith Carenti watched her son's team lose in the Oxford reserve team at the boat race. Still, she was able to console herself at the after-race party. She and her daughter topped the toe in that haute couture from La Croix. Becca went to the Anglomania Ball in New York and scored major club points by wearing Ralph Rucci, both on her body and on her arm too. Betsy Bloomingdale went to the Vanity Fair Oscar party. Disappointingly, she chose not to wear one of her 80 pieces of haute couture. Susan, still out and about in Paris, I never did find out how many pieces of haute couture she had. Mrs Petrie dines at her favourite French restaurant most days. It's always Chanel for lunch. And as for the feather dress, well, here it is. A full-page feature in Vogue. Still no mention of an owner. So, would I buy it if I won the lottery? You bet I would. El sol se fue Y yo cantando tu canción La soledad Sunday night on The Passionate Eye Hey, sweetie. Dr. Jack Kessler has his own reasons for taking up the challenge of stem cell research. As a father, I am both outraged and heartbroken. The politics and irrational fears of new technologies are depriving my daughter Allison of the possibility of walking again. But there are those with equally intense reasons that oppose it. Mr. President, a human embryo is a human life. Mapping stem cell research follows a father determined to help his daughter walk again. 
mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. As soon as we have our first real treatment that works, the pressure will become overwhelming. Hopefully it'll help my son. We have been praying. I think prayer is fine, but I think research is what's really what's going to get us the answers. I think most parents would tell you that if I could somehow put myself in that chair and have her walking, I would do it. A documentary that gives the stem cell debate a human face. Sunday night on The Passionate Eye.